how's it going? Good. How are you? Uh, I've been all right. I think quarantine. I'm. I'm kind of used to being isolated, and and I kind of do well on my own. I guess like I I like having time alone with my own thoughts. It's it's when I write you know material, but um, as as much as I've enjoyed kind of doing you know, strip back versions of our songs and, um, you know, acoustic covers and collaborations with, you know, some amazing musicians over the past year or so, uh, you know, from my house, I very much miss electricity at this point. Like the fact that we've now put out a full album and we've yet to play any of the songs live full force in front of an audience is just very bizarre. Um, but you know, kind of, you know, hanging in like everyone else, just playing the waiting game, um, hoping that you know we get back to a semblance of normal sooner than later. <laughs> sooner than later, I I don't know if what they're saying about this year is even going to be a thing, but it would be a miracle if it was able to happen. Yeah, I know. I'm hearing uh, I'm hearing mixed things, but it's not not looking great if I'm being honest. Yeah, yeah. Well, Death by Rock and Roll is a couple days old now. Congratulations. It was number one on iTunes in 10 different countries the day that it was released. That's incredible. It's insane. It's insane. I'm overwhelmed and like, I don't know, I feel like I'm still a little like shell-shocked almost. Like I, it doesn't, it, it's surreal. Like I can't, it still hasn't sunk in that it's actually out. Um, like we spent so long making it and then so long kind of sitting on it due to, the, due to the pandemic and stuff. And now it's finally out and everyone can hear it. And it's um, it's still taking a minute to sink in. But I'm just extraordinarily excited. And like the reception has just been incredible. And like, that's just the highest compliment you can get. So thanks, guys. <laughs> I mean, obviously it was highly anticipated because it has been quite a few years since your last album, Who You're Selling For, but it also, everybody just knows everything that you've kind of been through since then. So if that was even, it made it people more excited to hear about it. So, I mean, how does it like feel knowing that people are kind of eager to hear something that they know is going to be so full of pain and loss or or is it comforting knowing that you get to kind of share that grief with your fans it's a good question i don't know if i've thought about it like that in depth yet um you know i think this this album is such a personal record in so many ways um that you know i always say that you know i make the music for me i make the album for myself and then once you put it out into the world it no longer belongs to me it belongs to the listener and that's always kind of a weird thing that happens where it's almost like you almost have to mourn it and say goodbye to it in a way and it's like well you know it's like a child and going well I hope you I hope I raised you well I'm sending you off to college now and uh hope you do a good job and in in, you know with the rest of your life in the world mm-hmm. um but I think that you know I think at the end of the day even though this album is titled death by rock and roll I think the more the more time I've had to sit with it the more the more I realize, um, not that I didn't know this already, but the more I realize that this is actually a very hopeful album at the end of the day. Like it's, um, you know, it takes you on a journey that's that's very kind of full circle and it's, it's a very full circle story. And if you give it the grace to listen to it from front to back, like you will see that and you will come on that journey with me. And, and I hope that I hope that people see that and recognize that in this album and that, you know, maybe it can bring some solace to people who need it right now because they think that, especially in the crazy times we're living in, like everyone can use a little bit more hope and can't we always all use a little more rock and roll? So, you know, that's my, that's my hope for Death by Rock and Roll is that it, it brings some comfort to people who might need it right now. How, so the reception obviously has been good, but have you noticed any insights or anything that fans have picked up on kind of that have surprised you in any way? Um, not anything specifically. It's, it's, it's always interesting to see, you know, who reacts to what, um, because there are a lot of different kind of musical elements on this record. You know, it, it is, like I said, it is a full kind of complete journey and it delves into, you know, lots of kind of versions of rock and roll um and so it's it's always interesting to see what songs people gravitate towards the most um on first listen and and it's honestly it's and it's different for every person i've i've seen or spoken to so it's uh you know and that's always great like you never want everyone to just like one song and then forget the rest of them and so it's always nice to see that there's a a good balance between everything on it 
Yeah, and you've always been a little bit mysterious about not wanting to share your personal stories and meanings behind a lot of the songs too. Well, I also, I mean, that's for, it's twofold, but the, you know, one of the biggest reasons is because I already did. I already put it in the song. Like I already shared my, I bared my soul to you. And if you need an explanation above that, then that's on you. Like listen to the song again. So, um, you know, it's, it's not, like, I'm not, uh, you know, I can't be a, in a therapy session every time I do an interview, like that's what the music was for. So you gotta, so you have to kind of listen to it and take it, um, and take it and relate it to your own life. Because I also, I think that's also the power of music is that it's, it's how you relate to it that matters. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I was writing about or what it means to me. It, it matters how it affects you in your own life. Um, and that's why I was saying, I, you know, I hope that this album can bring some solace to people who might need it the same way that, you know, the records I love have brought solace to me when I needed it most. And, um, you know, if I can kind of pass that along and share that, then that's, you know, that's the greatest thing ever. Well, you guys also experienced a fair share of loss when you guys were making the Going to Hell album years ago too. Um, I mean, do you think that the best music sort of comes, it's a sick way to put it, but the best music seems like it comes out of personal turmoil and hardship. Well, I think that the best music comes from a really pure and honest place. And sometimes, you know, not all the time, but sometimes that, um, that kind of vulnerability and that kind of purity is stems from, you know, a tumultuous time period or, a, you know, a hardship. Um, I don't think that that's, I don't think it's a requirement, but I think that, but in one way, I think it is because I think that if you, if you segregate life and you only look at the happy, positive sides of life, then you're, you're missing half of it. And if you only look at the dark and depressing sides of life, then you're missing half of it. So in order to be kind of a complete person and a complete, you know, artist and a songwriter, you have to look at the full scope of everything and, and, and delve into all of all sides of that. Um, if, if that makes sense, I guess. And, and I don't know, I guess it's, it's just a running joke at this point that it, it wouldn't be a pretty reckless record if it wasn't played with some sort of like, you know, trauma or tragedy around it. So I don't know, it's, we're still here. <laughs> If you were able to give yourself advice and go back in time and tell yourself when you were going through everything you've been through, that there would be a light at the end of the tunnel and you would eventually come out of it, what do you think you would tell yourself? I would probably tell myself just that. I'd be like, hey, you know, shit's going to get really hard there for a while and you're not going to know where to turn or what to do and you're going to sink down and it's going to suck. Um but hang in there because, you know, I think that's the best advice anyone can give anyone. And even though if, I feel like a lot of times when you're, when you're going through it, you don't want to hear the phrase like it gets better or hang in there. Like, you know, those kind of cliche sayings, cause it's just like, you don't know, you don't know what I'm going through or how dare you say something like that to me, but it's actually true. And I, I've now come out the other side of it and I can be one of those people who preaches that and, and genuinely believes it. So I would, I would tell myself that and go, you know, it's going to suck for a while there, but it will get better. So hang in. Well, speaking of light at the end of the tunnel, I do kind of want to touch on your like aesthetic a little bit, because as a girl, this is just something I notice. So you, you seem to just be overall having a, like a lighter look lately. Like your, your makeup is lighter. You had the elegant outfits in the 25 video, you had the pink and, and so it went is, is there any kind of significance to it? Or did that kind of just happen on its own? Um, I mean, the lighter makeup just kind of, well, A, I'm not on stage right now. So like, you know, is, and the black, you know, the really, really dark black eye makeup, like that was, that was my identity when I was younger. But as, as I've gotten older, I've, I've, it's, it's just kind of, I've become more basic, I think. <laughs> with makeup. Like, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have the time to like do that every day all the time. Um, <laughs> you know, you're essentially painting every time you do that. Um, so, and you know, and then stage makeup is obviously a little grander and now I'm sitting at home in front of a computer, just kind of being, being me. So it's a little more stripped back, I guess. Um, and as far as the, you know, the, the outfits and the, and the wardrobe and stuff in, in the music videos, that, that all stems from the, the concept of the song and wanting to kind of create a visual to the music that um 
that encapsulates it and engrandizes it in some way that, you know, but, but at the same time doesn't take away from the song. And that can be kind of a tricky balance. Like it has to, they all have to meld. It all has to feel like a cohesive piece of work. Um, you know, the video and song have to, have to go together. And so, um, and I'm still a girl and like, it's really fun to put on fancy dresses. Like <laughs> I don't remember the last time I did that. So like, that's, you know, that's just a, that's a, a fun bonus on the side of it, but that's, um, but it came from this kind of grandiose thought process of, of this, you know, kind of tumultuous love story. And in the video, I made the lover New York city and, and wanting to kind of show the glamor and the grit and the juxtaposition of, of, of life and, you know, and, what it's like to be a New Yorker. Like it, it's, it comes with a lot of elements. Um, you know, it comes with a lot of pain and suffering, but also a lot of beauty. And I think that that is what I was trying to capture in the 25 video. I'm sure it was especially fun dressing up when uh, in quarantine, everybody's pretty much wearing pajamas all the time. <laughs> oh, oh, they were, I was, I got sweatpants. Someone was asking about my style the other day and I was like, well, it's black tank tops, black t-shirts pajama pants sweatpants socks and hoodies that's like I, that's my style at this point like <laughs> you know so it was, so yeah for sure to to get to uh kind of dress up and play with fashion again for the first time in a long time was um I had a lot of fun with that <laughs> I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and go back chronologically and talk about the events a little bit that led up to the making of this album so obviously the death of Chris Cornell was a huge loss to you, to me, to anybody who was a fan of him. It was a huge loss to the entire world. But what is it about losing somebody who you may not even know very well, but has still has a big importance to you that is that makes it so tragic and so hard to get over? It's a really good question, and I don't know that I have the answer. Um, it was... I think it was, it was, I mean, it was a culmination of a lot of things. It, it felt like the end of, I mean, like this band formed over the love of two bands. It formed over the love of we, the Beatles and Soundgarden. And so to lose, you know, to be that close um, in proximity and, you know, opening for Soundgarden was just the highest of highs. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Like we were just elated to be there. Um, you know, and to have it end so tragically that that added kind of shock of like, we're, is, we're right there. We were there that night. I, I talked to Chris Cornell, but I gave him a hug. I watched him leave the venue. Like, and then the night went on as normal and the, to wake up the next morning to the, the immense, just the bus, like the wait, like I, I'm, I sleep late. So I was the last to find out. And I woke up and walked into the front lounge and everyone's just like head in hand, devastated. And Everyone kind of looked up at me once she doesn't know, oh, this is going to be bad. <laughs> um, so I don't know what the, I don't know that there's an exact answer to that. It's just, I, I think that music has such a power to it that even if you don't know someone extraordinarily well personally, when you've related to their music and you've listened to those records, you know, throughout your whole life at nauseum, you, it feels like a part of you at that point. And so I feel like, you know, losing someone like that um is it's do you feel like you're losing a piece of yourself in a way um if that makes sense and and also you know in the grander scheme like losing someone who's that talented and that prolific um is just devastating because it's like well that that was it like that was it no like that, that can't be it and so it's just it's a big you know it's, it's a shock and it's a trauma and it's and it's um you know but the good news is is that why I think music is so powerful is that it it lives on for eternity you know like the music is your legacy and that that can never die and I think that that's that's really beautiful and that's certainly what I hope that when I'm no longer here which will happen at some point hopefully a long time from now but you know um I hope that my music is is something that that lives on and um and that's what I'm remembered by and for I guess and then what, as soon as you were starting to lift yourself out of that shock a bit and the trauma, you were going to go back into the studio. Did you have any material written by that point? Um, I had written a few songs just to kind of pull myself out of that. Like when we, when, after Chris passed, we played a few shows after that, but I very quickly came to the conclusion that I was not in a good 
the headspace to be public. Like I needed, I needed to, uh, to take a step back and like getting on stage every night and performing a, you know, entertaining show for fans who are so deserving of that when I wasn't fully there was not fair to them. Um, and so I, I canceled everything and I went home and I tried to kind of process and get my feet back on the ground. And as soon as I started to do that, I was starting to write again. I had a few, a few songs and I was calling Cato and I was going, I don't, we all got to move forward, man. Like we gotta, we gotta do something like we're all in this funk. Um, and so I don't, I, I have some songs. I don't know what they're for. I don't know if it's for a record or an EP or just, or for nothing. And like, just for us to, you know, start doing something again. Um, and as soon as we kind of put those plans in motion, I got the call that he died in a motorcycle accident. And, and that obviously, you know, shut everything down. It was the nail in the coffin for me where I just, you know, I was just as I was starting to rebuild myself. I, and I, I sunk so low that I didn't, I'd never experienced anything like that before where it was, I sunk so down into depression and this, this hole of just darkness that I didn't know how to get out of. And, you know, substance abuse, just everything that comes with grief and loss and trauma. And, and I felt, and I, and I didn't know how to get out of it. And I didn't, I didn't really care if I did. I think that was the scarier part is I was, I would kind of given up on life and um, I kind of looked around and when everything I love is dead, what's the fucking point? And, um, and that's a very scary headspace to be in because you don't, you know, especially when you're living it, you really don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You just, you, that's not something that even exists to you. Um, so to make a, a very long story short, it was music, like as cliche as that may sound, it was the thing that really pulled me back to life. Um, and, you know, I started by listening to all the, you know, I kind of asked myself, I was like, Taylor, what was, what made you love this in the first place? Like, what was the thing that, like, where did this all start for you? And, and the answer was really simple. The answer was the Beatles. So that's where I started. I kind of went back to the beginning and I listened to every Beatles record and every demo and every anthology. And from that kind of went down my musical history of how I learned music to begin with, you know, so into Led Zeppelin and The Who and Pink Floyd and ACDC and Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton and, you know, the list goes on and on and on and eventually being able to listen to Soundgarden again and have it bring me joy. Um, and that was a big turning point because the next step from that, you know, kind of naturally in, in progression of healing was picking up the guitar and starting to play music again and not just listen to it, but actually play it. And that once I started to do that, the floodgates kind of opened and this record just kind of poured out of me, <laughs> like whether I wanted it to or not, it was like everything that I had been repressing or, you know, trying to hide from or whatever, like was, I was suddenly confronted with it um, in this massive way. And it just kind of, it was like a dam bursting. And I think that 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 was really the first major step that I took in kind of healing myself and getting myself back on the right track because, you know, writing music has always been the place that, um, that it's always been cathartic and it's always been the place that I can really kind of find my center and my balance as a person. And it had been something that I was avoiding, like, you know, I just shut it out of my mind and, and I didn't even think to turn to it. And so when I finally did, it was, um, it was very healing. It was very, it was like the first major step of me going, I'm, I'm getting back on the right path now. So you get back into the studio, you write the record, you record the record, it's finished. Then the pandemic hits. What, what was, what, what did you think then? Well, you know, it was a lot of one, two punches, um, to say the least pandemic hits, you know, uh, I don't know. I was honestly, when it, I don't think anyone quite knew how serious it was at the beginning, you know, so we, I was, I was very fortunate. I'm in, um, in happy, like in a, in a small way that we had right before lockdown started, we had just finished shooting the album cover. Like, so we got that in by the, the nick of time, not knowing that, um, that, you know, quarantine was going to become a thing. Um, and so I felt very fortunate that we actually completed this body of work and I didn't, you know, that, that aspect, the creation of it wasn't going to have to drag on for another like year. Um, but then the waiting, you know, the waiting game of releasing it became the next thing. And that's, and that was a very weird 
it's a very weird thing because it's a very strange thing to put out music and not be able to play it live like this just it's just very bizarre like death by rock and roll the song you know the first song we put out in years i believe was our fifth number one and we've yet to play it in front of an audience live like how bizarre is that? Um, so it's it just became, you know, the same thing as like a lot of bands of just this kind of, you know, staying in the doldrums kind of, but also trying to stay positive. And I had also become very used to my routine of, of being at home and alone. So like, I, I felt like I actually handled it overall pretty well, or I'm handling it pretty well. I've certainly had my like you know, breakdown moments, probably like everyone has, where you just, you start to feel a little crazy. But, um, mm -hmm. but overall, I think uh, I kind of thrive in solitude. So I've, I've been doing all right, I guess. You know, the other good thing that came out of this is that you were able to end up collaborating both live and on the record with the members of your favorite band with Soundgarden. And Only Love Can Save Me Now, definitely one of the top songs on the record. But if you were to be approached by them to work on music with them in the future, would you do it again? Oh, hell yeah. This. Love it. Okay. <laughs> absolutely. I love, I love them to the ends of the earth and back, like not just as musicians, but as people. Like they're absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, I wouldn't even, you wouldn't even have to ask me. It would already be a, it's, that's a, that's done deal. <laughs> Sick. It was great talking to you and I hope you keep hanging in there and looking forward to when we get to see you on stage again. I know, me too. It's, it's been way too long. <laughs> I feel like it's going to be longer than I want it to be. And I'm trying to, I'm very sad about it, but I'm trying to stay hopeful. So won't think about that today. <laughs> it's going to be an explosion when it is. So <laughs> yeah, I know I keep my joke is that it's like tantric sex. Like it's, we've just been deprived of it for so long that by the time live shows do come back, they're just going to explode. <laughs> like it's going to be crazy. It's going to be like a battle of the bands to see who can get the buses first and all that shit. <laughs> it's going to be nuts. Well, thank you for your time today. Stay safe. And we will hopefully talk soon. Hopefully in person.